you kind of lose your humanity in Judaism, you're not doing it right. A lot of the criticism came from people who don't understand this detail, that there are still many people who don't believe it happens. I think it definitely saved lives. Just because you're around doesn't mean it, it stops someone. In the community, he is looked at. He's on the wall of shame. Um, and he is a registered sex offender. So, you know, whether people talk about it or not, people do look at him like a monster. So you got nothing to lose. At least help others get inside your head and to, to, to save other people in this community. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more. More from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. All right, I'm sitting here with Mendy Pellin. Mendy, welcome to the In Search of More podcast. Thank you, thank right. you. Have you heard of us? Oh. I've heard of you, and I think you invited me on because I did In Search of what some people think is too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I think you found too much. That was, yeah, yeah. That was, that was a lot. So should we, should we go there? I kind of felt like talking about um, you a little before we go into the background, but to give the audience who may not be familiar, maybe they're just, you know, they have no idea what's going on in the Crown Heights community and they just watch the um, podcast. You're saying for people out of town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on Crown Heights, that's, we call every, everywhere right. outside of Crown Heights is out of town. For the guy. Yeah. <laughs> so for those recently, you did an interview uh, with a gentleman by the name of Gershon, I forget his last name. Um, What's the last we thing? didn't put it in there. You didn't put it in there? No. <laughs> oh, so interesting. Yeah. So you did an interview with uh, a guy by the name of Gershon. You put yeah. his first name in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, who He was arrested previously yeah. for sexually abusing a child. I don't know how much, how much, like if the specifics were public as part of the arrest. Yeah. And somehow, some way, you got him to agree to sit down with you, do an interview, and you aired that about a week ago. Did you release it on Tisha B'Av? It was right before Tisha B'Av. You released it. Was that on purpose? Yeah. Not because of Tisha B'Av. We just uh, wanted to wait till the uh, one of the survivors was not, you know, in the city or whatever. So, got you. So you so you thought of things before doing it. You didn't just. Uh, this was filmed close to two years ago. Oh wow! So there was a lot of thought. There was a lot of thought. A lot of deliberation. yeah. Okay, so we'll get to that. I yeah. still want to get to you, but you released this interview about a week ago, um, and it's brought up a lot. It's brought a lot to the surface. A lot of people coming thanking you, a lot of people criticizing, a lot of people questioning, a lot of people going back and forth. So that's the background. I've always wanted to have you on the, the podcast. Yeah, I know. But I thought you'd say yes now. Yeah, I had to interview a molester to get on this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> nah. Yeah. And what is this room we're in? We are in a studio in Crown Heights. It's called Flow Motion Studios. Okay. Yeah. Nice. A little different than the um, than the typical background, but I think the audience will get used to it. Yeah, it's understand. a dark, dark topic. <laughs> right. We need the right setting. Yeah. For it. Yeah, it would be a little bit too much. Uh... Okay. So, in terms of your own personal story, just a little bit before we get to that. So, when you, when you started the video, you called yourself a comedian. A lot of people know you as a a comedian, and you know maybe I'll weave this into the actual video. Is that some said a comedian shouldn't handle this topic. But my understanding of a comedian is someone who's... Like I, I, the, the caricature is kind of like Robin Williams for me. Maybe it's not everyone. Where there's usually something much more behind the laugh. I guess they're good at making someone else, others laugh. But it's not because they're super cheery and happy and funny. Naturally, they just figured out a way to use humor as way to do things. Are, do you agree with that caricature and, or that archetype? And if so, are you a member of that? So it's interesting. I, I, I get asked that a lot, but I, I don't want to get like painted into a corner that there's all this trauma that, and that's why he's a comedian. I think that I always had looked at things and analyzed things a little differently than a lot of people in a comedic way. And that helped me overcome a lot of burdens in life, a lot of struggles. So it's not like it 
was created because of trauma. You get what right. I'm saying? Right. Right. Meaning you have you have a certain gift or you know, meaning you were probably naturally born with an ability to look at things slightly differently yeah. and deliver it in a way that others found funny. Correct. Right. Usually a comedian is like the good ones for me are very pointed in the sense that they're they're saying something that maybe someone else couldn't say, but because they deliver it funny, yes. it manages to get through our normal defenses. Would yeah, you agree with that? Un- until pretty recently, I think that in the last couple of years, they were able to fly under the radar, and then a lot of people caught on to this. That, yeah, right, what the comedians are that really about did. the comedians are delivering stuff we don't want people to hear. So then they started coming down hard on the com- war on comedians. That's right. why like Jerry Seinfeld won't uh, do college campuses last couple of years. Um, it, it's just, it became, it became like too intense. Anything you say gets scrutinized, you know? Right. Oh, crap. I, <laughs> I get upset at people for putting yeah. on the, uh, leaving their phone okay. on. Good. If I can help you be more understanding of others. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. I'm shutting this off. Yeah. Okay, so but so you don't want to go full bore into I am a traumatized victim or something else, but the you would agree that it's not coming from a shallowness; it's coming more from a depth. This. Correct. Yes, uh, there's definitely a lot of things that I've experienced personally that gave me an insight into uh, a lot of a lot of struggles and a, a lot of a, a certain empathy that uh, I'm blessed with. Can you give an example? Um, my father died when I was 10. So that, you know, that's like a whole. Right. The whole big uh, thing. And then going, saying Kaddish three times a day, uh, a prayer for the deceased, going to 770, which is the big mm-hmm. synagogue here. And then after every. Uh, prayer service after every Kaddish, someone's coming over to me, some old guy or someone like, uh, who are you saying Kaddish for? What, what, oh, your, your father, you're so young. How old was your father? Oh, how did, how did he pass away? That's so sad. You know, like some, right. <laughs> some well-intentioned people. <laughs> right, having to read Yeah, yeah, story. just like I had daily conversations of, uh, so, you know, that, that alone gives a sensitivity that maybe uh, it's a little hurtful if you ask questions because you're, uh, you know, it'll be helpful for yourself for gossip or whatever, just to know, you know. <laughs> for clickbait. Yeah, exactly. But what's interesting is a few weeks ago, I had a gentleman at my home, um, came for Shabbos, whose father passed away young. Maybe he was under 10, but young when his father passed away. And he had a lot of, he felt like a lot of his struggle came from the communal reaction to his father passing away. So I wonder if this was kind of similar to your experience in that, you don't know, he's like called the Yasin, he's the Yasin, you know? Where yeah. There's very little that, kind of growing up in Crown Heights, it was very little that I was, very few terms you can refer to someone that would garner sympathy from, from everyone. Yeah. But this one seemed to. And he felt like he was coddled in a very extreme way by friends and uh, the schooling system. And as a result, it had him feeling very apart from. Would you agree with? Yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely hated when, uh, like, I didn't want anyone to treat me any differently, you know. In, in fact, treat me worse than regular people just to make sure you're not, you know. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so you got you got your wish for with this video. <laughs> no, but but I mean, like that would, you know, like there was times. I don't know why I'm thinking about this. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's kind of like a follow up. Uh, I remember it's just coming back. I was in Yiskar, which is a a prayer we a do prayer a we do, yeah, ago. where they send all the kids out of the shul. So I remember they they say in Yiddish, you know, kinderos, kinderos, you know, <laughs> and I'm like staying there in shul because I. Uh, you know, I gotta say Yiskar, and and then people sometimes even literally like yanked me to like leave, and I had to be like, my father died. I'm <laughs> supposed to be here, okay? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I can see I, yeah. actually in talking to you how, right, like in those moments, using the the comedy kind of helped helped in a lot of ways. Yes. Almost seeing, you know, what it makes me think is like this guy who I was talking to had he had this gift, his life probably wouldn't have been as hard. Yes. Yes. And uh, um, unfortunately for. Uh, a lot of people I know, they uh, were in similar circumstances and uh, it didn't end as, as well, you know. Right. So you, f- you feel like in some way this is a gift. It's a, definitely a gift. gift. It's you- hard to turn off, but, you know, right. it's not, I don't think a, a lot of people want it, but it definitely it had helped me get through a lot, you know. Right. Right. I can see. And do you, f- do you feel that it leads people to misunderstanding you yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i definitely sometimes i push the wrong buttons uh over the years but uh um because i you know i'll think something's funny or i'll say something and uh and it's in the wrong place the wrong time a little too much right you know so okay right I hear from that side but i, I meant the question a little bit differently in the sense that you know, earlier I, I described it as comedy coming from a place of depth, right? And you gave one example. I'm sure there are more. We'll get to that. But um, meaning being misunderstood in the sense that someone is seeing, oh, he's just a comedian. He's a silly guy. Viewing it as a shallow personality versus the depth of a personality and someone developing a tool to be able to deal with, you know, being in the... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, so that feeling of being misunderstood—that's what I meant. That. Oh, I see. I see. Not that you went too far, and someone's like, "Hey, yeah, I no, I no, for sure, a hundred percent." And there's a uh, a lot of work that I've done where I just accept the fact that people, you know, they see, a, you know, for lack of a better term, a clown, and and if it's attached to something more serious, then they'll, you know, they they might not. It, it kind of dilutes it so there are there's a lot of work that i've done that a lot of people have seen and uh been a part of and they didn't know that i was behind it because i didn't want to you know water it down oh you felt you felt like it would yeah okay so in this case with the gershon interview you decided to to go for it why um there isn't there's I, I I figured it was very heavy. It, originally, I wasn't gonna be in it at all. I was gonna just have some, you know, sound bites from him. Um, but I I kind of felt like it just needed someone to to kind of hold people's hands because it was so heavy. That is more um, relatable. Like, like you know? needing certain prompts through it. Yeah. Versus him just exactly yeah. speaking. Yeah, I think so, some felt like you didn't do enough. Meaning, I don't know, maybe they wanted you to vomit when he said something or throw things at him. Right. Do you, what do you feel about that? Well, you know, the, these are questions that I've wrestled with, uh, you know, and, and there were certain points where I decided I'm not going to release it, you know. And, like, there are definitely valid questions and 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 um i think that the best like in order to get the information the best person to get it from is the horse's mouth in a lot of cases and um i've done other projects where i've done that where i've used the bad guys to um talk about the bad they've done and it left a big impression on people because um, it's one thing to hear from somebody else. They may have an agenda or whatever, but to hear it straight from the, the person. Yeah. Right. So, Is there another one you can speak to? You're comfortable speaking to? Um, well, a, a, a recent one that I, well, kind of recent, there's a, uh, a Left to Her documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, when I heard about what was going on over there, um, I, I've, for many years, I've been doing videos and projects for survivors and uh, behind the scenes. Survivors of 
child sex abuse. Gen- generally, it's child sex uh, sex abuse, but um, in this situation, well, I guess it it would be under that category as well. Um, right. Many of them are, if not all of them, are survivors of child sex abuse, but also much more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't usually talk about it, so I'm a little. <laughs> what? Uh, no, I mean about this this uh, work this that I've done. Yeah. But the videos are out there. Your name is not associated yeah, my, with it. Yeah, my name is not associated with it. I got you. Uh, but for example, I used to look at the Left to Heart cult as a, um, the same way an outsider might look at us as extreme. So we look at them as extreme, but it's not in our place to judge. But once I heard of like the abuse that's going on over there and like what a cult is, um, I decided to put something out there to educate people and um, it got more views than I expected. It got uh, over six, seven million views. Wow. And, um, and it really shifted, it shifted the whole the conversation. Yeah, the whole perception and it, it literally saved kids from bringing that awareness and and in that video itself, I use the leaders to talk about, don't ask me how I got that, but yeah. I use the leaders to sort of uh, confess to some of the bad things that they, uh, right. they did, and that's why it was so impactful. Right. I mean, there were some interviews even, I think it was on the BBC in Canada, where they spoke and they tried to be polite and defend themselves, but it was very clear, just in their own words that um, this is a problematic. Yeah. I think you got to give the viewers some credit that they're going to read between the line. Obviously, the leaders are pleading for their case and they're they're, like they were arguing at one point like, no, we didn't marry off a uh, 12-year-old. She was 13. That's (laughs) a lie. You know, so, (laughs) so, you know, that he is painting a bad picture and I'm, and I don't. I'm not spelling it out to the viewer. I'm le- I'm respecting the viewer that you are going to draw your conclusions. Right. <laughs> this is the probably the most fascinating criticism that I saw about the um, video was that you gave him a platform, as if I mean, does he have it now? This platform. I don't know where I don't know where the platform is, but. <laughs> But I mean, he couldn't even, if, if he wanted to deliver a message again to the same audience, he couldn't do it. This whole idea of giving someone a platform when this uh, Left to Heart guy was on the BBC, was he given a platform or was he exposed to, or, or, or was he being exposed? And there are many, um, you have uh, Project Veritas, right, which does a lot, of, a lot of those undercover interviews. Were they giving the guy a platform or were they exposing him? So this felt like an expose, not a. Uh, yeah platform but i like the way you framed it is that it's it's disrespecting the viewer to assume that we need to spell it out so clearly for them or else they might what hire him as a babysitter what was the what was the, not their, their first choice babysitter <laughs> right they might, he might become their third choice you know when you really yes. can't find anybody <laughs> right um no i i think that Anyone that watches it, and I and I left it in a certain way. I had other people, professionals with you know letters after their names that also reviewed it very carefully. We took some things out, and and I made sure to keep a lot of it raw so that it doesn't it doesn't take away from the severity of what he did. And and I think that anyone that watches that will see exactly who he is right i've you know I've, I've shared my story a lot on being sexually abused as a child and i've spoken to many people who've shared their story as well right when i was more involved with jcw we would go to different cities and i thought it was always helpful if someone from that community spoke and shared their story like i did in crown heights i did it in miami and there's something when someone steps out from behind uh, you know the curtain and says hey this this happened to me it makes it a little bit more real for the audience and I was, I was careful never to be too graphic, and it's not my my style to to do things that are like just sensationalist. But I always wanted to be clear on what I meant by sexual abuse, 
because it's so vague. You know, did he pinch my tuchus while I was walking by? Is that what I mean by sexual abuse? Or did he use my body to reach orgasm, right? That's, so I would say it often in that way when I was speaking so that we're clear about what, what happened here. Like that's, he locked me in a room, he lied on top of me, he moved his pants, and he used my body to, uh, to, to achieve orgasm. And I think that the reason to say that is so that people understand what is it that we're talking about when we say child sex abuse. Yeah. Do you know the, the name um, Yosef Caro? He was arrested in Miami a number of years ago, the, five the, or six years the ago. name definitely rings a bell. What, what's his story? So he was, he was arrested for abusing a child. There was a video of him taking an 11 or 12-year-old girl, I think, to the back of a Judaica store or something like that. I remember the, I mean, he may have been a rabbi. I don't remember all the details. But when he was arrested, he said that he had his hands down the girl's pants um, because she was spiritually unclean and he was spiritually purifying. And the community came to his support. They actually came came to support. There were, I was just, it was it was mind boggling to me. I mean, he literally said what he did. He just didn't give it the ill intent. He he said his hands were there. He just didn't say it was for for sexual purposes. And he got defense. And and he, a lot of people came to his defense. A lot a lot of people came to his defense. And to me, that story is like an example of why sometimes we need to be specific. So when a guy like Gershon comes out and says, no, he knew exactly what he was doing, and he was doing it in front of other people. I was shocked by that. I was shocked by that portion, the brazenness of, yeah. uh, of, uh, of it. And I was thinking, hey, if I learned something from this, and I've been steeped in this conversation for eight or 10 years, the average viewer certainly has, has learned something. Yeah, yeah, that, that I prepared myself before the interview, and that was something completely new that I did not know about him. Um, I think pretty much all that he said besides for that in the interview is, is public. Um, and uh, that, was, uh, that was a shocker. And I felt like I needed to get details because this is something very important. Yeah, I think that's important for... That's that's an important detail for parents to know. Yeah. That just because you're around doesn't mean it it stops someone. Yeah. It may be I don't know if I was picking up on that when he was talking, but there may have been I don't know if it was opportunistic or that may have been a detail that um added to the the excitement for him in some way, to the intrigue that he was able to do it when everyone Right. Was I, there. I was wondering if I saw a twinkle in his eye when he was um, describing that that detail almost as something that he was able to get away with and do, and everyone was was right there. Right. Yeah, I I, um, I think that I think he he just didn't care. Like he was at a point in his life where he just didn't care. Do you feel like that's what motivated the interview? Now, because it is peculiar that he went and did this interview. A lot of people are asking why. Why did he do it? Well, first of all, I think that he doesn't have much to lose. And that's what I, that was kind of my sales pitch. That um, in the community, he is looked at. He's on the wall of shame. Um, and he is a registered sex offender. So, you know, whether people talk about it or not, people do look at him like a monster. So you got nothing to lose. At least help others get inside your head and to 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 save other people in this community. That's why you presented it to me. Yeah. Right. So from day one, you thought that this getting out there could potentially help many people. Yeah. I've done I've done many interviews with survivors and you know, even help make uh, events for, you know, and it, and it, it did garner some awareness, but a, a lot of it was, uh, um, the people that showed up, the people that listen, it was an echo chamber and yeah, right. you know, it, was, it was, yeah, yeah it was yeah. like, it was, uh, affirmation, confirmation, uh, whatever the word is, you know, validation. That's the word. Right. Sometimes it was yeah. immediate family, which came and then they yeah. were. Their but mind was changed. It, but listen, yeah. they, they those stories 
I don't want to lighten those stories. Those stories created a, a lot of amazing education, um, and it, it gave support to other survivors. It it uh, it really helped other survivors. Um, but it was it was kind of frustrating how it wasn't opening the eyes. I was still speaking to a lot of people that were saying, ah, it doesn't, you know, like the, how, you know, how often does that happen? You know? Right. I think that I, a lot of the criticism came from people who don't understand this detail that there are still many people who don't believe it happens. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, uh, and a lot of them are parents that have kids under their care that are clueless. Right. Or that if it does happen, the guy can go to a therapy session and it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take care of it in post. Right. We don't know why people are struggling stopping alcohol and pornography and um, drugs. And they're working for years on getting sober. But this guy can go to one therapy session and somehow he's, yeah. he's um, cleaned. Although I don't, I, don't compare, I, I don't put this in the same category as, uh, as, as an addiction. Because there may be an addictive component to it, but there's something else. That stacked on top of it, which um, I think came through in an interview, certainly to me and probably to others, is there was a, a disconnection of sorts that he, uh, that he had. It's almost like he was told this is wrong, and there's a law that it's wrong, and there's a punishment that he gets, and there's social consequences to it. So as a result, he came on board with the fact that, okay, it's probably wrong. But it was a very logical, yes. it felt all very, very cerebral yeah. to me, his process. Was it difficult for you interviewing him, um, mm. editing it, <laughs> emotionally difficult? That was really, yeah, one of the toughest things I've ever done. It was just sit, uh, it was a six-hour interview. Wow. I wanted to make sure to get everything. Uh, it was all done in one day? One day, one sitting. Wow. And um, You know that's what we're in for here, right? Six hours. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now that was, oh my gosh, it was very, very difficult. And also um, part of it is, you know, urging him to talk more. So you got to uh, be empathetic to some degree um, to, to let him talk. I that was my it. job to, to get, him, get him to talk more and more and more. So. And that was, so that part of it was difficult, meaning having to... It was very difficult hearing that stuff and then, you know, giving a smile and... and I understand. And follow-ups and like, right. oh, okay, so then why did you do that? And I was like, oh my God, you know. And then afterwards, I'm sure, if you took six hours and turned it into an hour video, I felt like it was a little bit long, personally. Yeah. Like, did we need, did we need all, all of that? There was plenty there, but could it have been 30 minutes, 20 minutes? I don't know. But not as a criticism, just saying I wonder right. if the same effect could have happened. But to take six hours and turn it into, it's, it, it takes less time to take six hours and put it out at six hours yeah. than it does to take six hours. And like the more you cut it down, the, yeah. the more work. Yeah. And also, I, I wanted to keep like sections, not like uh, not cut it out. So it's, uh, you have a couple words and a couple words. Right. Um, so here's five minutes of a topic. He's yeah, really exactly. To have to, to get it real, to see like I didn't, I didn't edit this, these sentences together for him. Like he is actually saying this stuff, you know. Right. And you can feel that. You can feel the flow, right, building for a while, and then yeah. okay, a new topic. So in the editing, you must have spent, you must have watched this footage. Too, yeah, too much. Way too much. So. When you say it's difficult, walk, walk someone through why that is so, so difficult for someone who's not. It, it, I, I think it makes sense to most people because watching a few minutes of it is very difficult. So doing that multiple times or being the person who has to, you know, not yell at the guy when he says certain things, but to s still be there to facilitate the conversation. So I think to most people, it makes sense that it's difficult. But then when I see certain feedback that came your way, like, oh, he was just doing this for clickbait, for views, for this thing. Like, really, he, this guy's pretty creative. He couldn't have thought of anything. He had strimals and chains with pretty funny, you know, <laughs> yeah, stuff that got him plenty of views. He doesn't need to do, go like, down into the gutter to get something yeah. that's, uh, that's yeah. click-worthy. So, but what that feedback tells me is that they obviously don't understand the cost 
the emotional cost involved in producing something like this. So can you walk us in? Well, I think a, a, a big part that, that, uh, like, like the reason why it took so long, a big part had to do with that. I, I had to do it in dosages. Like I couldn't sit through such a long time. So like the editing after the interview, I couldn't even look at the footage for, for a while. It's just like that, that I needed time to, uh, <laughs> decompress. Decom yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then it, there was a lot of, lot of back and forth. Um, there was a lot of different versions that was, that were made. Um, I showed it to, to Rabbanim to make sure that the religious aspect was, I wanted to get an okay, not, not, a, not to make it public, just so that I know. And also some professionals. Right, you're not going to say their name. Yeah. Right, because there's no reason to bring There's no up. reason. I you know, just when, saw, I, so I know, you know. Just a small um, tangent, but then get back to what we're saying. One of my favorite stories of, you know, if I didn't Steinsaltz? Yeah. So when he changed the Tzur the, uh when he was translating the Gemara into Hebrew, so he had to change the layout of the page. And even though it's the oral Torah, which meant it was never meant to be put on paper, we have a way of making everything holy, because for whatever, whatever reason. So even the fact it wasn't supposed to be put on paper, and as a compromise, some sages decided to put it on paper. When they did, suddenly that became, not the words became holy, of course the words are holy, but the the font and the layout, you know, where you have, let's say, four inches of Rashi Taisfis, of, of the Gemara, and a Rashi that stops abruptly, and a Taisfis that seems to wrap around the whole page, right? So you can look at it, and you're like, oh, yeah, for sure, Baba Kama Duff, you know. Uh, you know. Bays. Exactly. Yeah. So he had to change that in order to fit in the Hebrew text. And before doing so, he went to the Rebbe, and he asked him um, whether or not he should do this. And he was given okay. Fast forward, he goes and does it and gets incredible amounts of criticism, like some vile, vile, vile um, hatred towards him. Some, I think, that was very extreme within the religious community, that it's, uh, it was terrible what he did. And for years, he never said that, um, he never said publicly that the Rebbe was the one who told him it was okay. He said, I'm comfortable. I did my due diligence, and I'm comfortable with the process I went through to arrive at this decision. And what do I need to send more hate upstream? So he didn't... Uh, wow, he was so, way ahead of his time. Yeah, so he shielded it. Yeah, it took me a lot, uh, many years to, uh, to realize that once you start getting into the mode of explaining yourself and pointing at like, oh, but this guy said I could, mm -hmm. and that guy, like the hate is going to hate. Hate is going to hate. There are legitimate people bringing up legitimate questions that are not haters that um, maybe they didn't think it through all the way, or... They just don't see the full picture, so I don't blame them for right. you know. But still, like, engaging with, um, I engage with some people, um, people I respect, and people I know generally. Um, but I'm generally not trying to explain myself. Like as long as I feel, and I did my due diligence, I you know, right. I'm right. good. Yeah, there, there's definitely legitimate questions, but I think that. When someone approaches it as a question, it's different than when someone attacks. Because to assume that you didn't go through this process and somehow Dr. Michael Solomon just showed up on a chair <laughs> talking to you, I, I, doesn't the audience think that you and him went back and forth on that footage? Doesn't the audience think that you and him went back and forth with Patty Fitzgerald on that footage? You would think. But for whatever reason, like someone will just fire out a you know, a comment, like for me, it felt too long, right? I asked a question to you and you explained, I didn't want to chop it up and put something that anyone can look at and say, hey, it's edited. Right. So it may be too long, but there's a reason it's, yeah. so then it's, you know, so, and then there's other things that are coin tosses sometimes where you're like, should I put it out or should I not? And then you go through a certain process and you may get a no along the way. And then eventually you do it. And the assumption on the other side sometimes is that, Oh, you just willy nilly went and right. There was none of that deliberation yeah. back and forth. Listen, there are people that put out content like that, you know. But I think it's I think it's important to give people the benefit of the doubt these days. Like a lot of the comments and a lot of the people that fire back, like they assume the worst in other people. 
you know. Right. They start they start from, They start off it's right. just assuming the worst. Like <laughs> clicks. He wants to build up <laughs> followers. He wants you know. Yeah, to me there's a difference when someone fires off a comment or you know, obviously I posted a lot of stuff about this so I got things from a number of people. And when someone takes the time to write a post and edit it and at one point did you not think maybe I should reach out to him and get his take before I say something about what he what he did wouldn't that be what what do you like wouldn't that be um like a professional level of journalism so to speak if I'm going to put a piece of content out and there's a person yeah who who worked on this just hey reach out and if there's no comment then you say in there hey I tried to reach out for comment I they didn't so I just have to go with my my assumption anyway I kind of hijacked a point you were saying about the rabbanim so meaning you took it to rabbanim you took it to um other professionals you were saying that and then i went to the din stein's old story so i wanted to go back to yeah no worries that <laughs> this mm-hmm. goes this flows wherever it's gonna be sure 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 um but uh yeah i i was surprised that people did not uh some people uh that i respected like didn't even reach out like like hey let's talk about it let's uh discuss this uh before starting to post all these uh uh, long carousels of why, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, why are the moral authority on this? There is one influencer I I respect her. She, um, she messaged me that I respect you. I hope you understand. I have to go out against this because I I believe it's wrong. And I said thanks for giving me a heads up. I appreciate it. But I did add, I'm like, if you want to talk about what went on behind this, what the logic is, give me a call. But it didn't go that far. Right. But they did at least give you a heads <laughs> but up. But they at least gave me a heads up. Um, there is one, uh, one influencer that uh, said, hey, the, the mob's going to be against me. You know, like, I can't, I can't tolerate it, you know, having all this hate. Uh, but I, I want to personally support what you're doing i think it's amazing years ago i got a message from someone and he said to me i just want to let you know the stuff you're doing um around child sex abuse i'm a silent supporter of so i said if you're silent you're the enemy not a supporter because in this subject i think that um specifically in child sex abuse there's the you know you know they say like the sutton gets you coming and going Right, I've, I've shared about this concept in uh, just before Krishma read Hashkivenu Vino Shalom Vavdenu Mokenu Chaim Tevim, and in there it says Vahaser um, Satan Milfanenu Umecharenu. So someone asks, what's the one before and after? Right, so the the Satan gets you coming and going first with temptation and then with let's say guilt. Oh, go check this out. Look at this thing. And have some fun. The next morning you wake up and you say, I can't believe I did that. Same Satan. Yeah, right, same voice. Yeah. yeah, shame. It's the same. It's the same yeah. idea. So with very many things, like for example, addiction, addiction comes with something else and it's the denial of it. You can watch someone, it's amazing to watch because when someone is steeped in addiction, there'll always be denial that comes through it. It's like, how can you not see it? You've been, you've been drunk. I remember seeing this guy. He, he didn't mean to attack me, like walking into shul on Shabbos. He was doing it in a friendly way, but it was very uncomfortable. And he was like crazy drunk. And at that time in my life, I wasn't coming to shul too often. And he just like let me have it when I walked through the door about what I was wearing and uh, other things I was doing. And I was like, wow, so uncomfortable. Like, why would he do this? So I called him the next day and I said, you know, it's like, I don't know what you were thinking, but that wasn't fun for me. So he said, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm drunk. I was, I was pretty drunk. And at that point I was, you know, in 12 steps, not for long enough to know not to preach. So like just enough to start getting some liberation, but not long enough to to not be a little bit of a preacher. So I said to him, have you thought maybe you have a problem with alcohol? And he said, uh, no. Like, straight away, no. What do you mean, no? <laughs> like, you just told me you berated me because, yeah, you know, you were drunk. That means you did something you don't want to do. And it's not the first time you were drunk. He said, well, I know I don't have a problem because I once put all my alcohol in my freezer for 30 days and I didn't touch it. So I said, did you put your cocaine there too? He said, no, I don't do cocaine. I said, exactly. Exactly. Right? No nice. problem with cocaine. It's just your alcohol that you have to yeah. count the amount of days you put away. So what's my point is that there's a lot, there's, there's, in order 
for the addictive mind to keep doing what it's doing. It kind of gets you coming and going. One, it gets you in the bars. And the second is somehow this level of denial that it's existing. So I think sexual abuse also comes with this weird combo. And one is, it can happen to a lot of people, a ton of people go through the same thing. But with it, there's a secret. We can't tell anyone. Like addiction has denial and sexual abuse has a secret. Or it's silence. We can't talk about it. We can't talk about it. Like the second I realized that, I'm like, wow, that's what it wants me to do. Yeah. The way it gets me coming and going is I'm going to do this to you, and then you're not going to be able to talk about it. And you'll see almost uniformly around child sex abuse is the, I don't, I don't, like the demonic energy wants to keep it silent. So like the silent supporter, that's why I say that. Yeah. Is the, is yeah, the. Yeah, I, I was living in California for about 10 years. And when I moved back, I was having a conversation with a friend and, and, uh, uh, we were in a bagel place and I was telling him about my, uh, I have irritable bowel disease, mm -hmm. ulcerative colitis. So I was telling him about it and he was like, shh, you know, like people are hearing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, is this still a thing here? We're right. still trying to keep everything. <laughs> like I, I totally forgot about that whole mentality. And that day I went on Facebook and I just like, hi, I'm Andy Pellin and I have ulcerative colitis. I just posted that because I felt like, because he said, shh, I, I got to right, post it. Yeah, like, this is ridiculous that we're still quieting people about it. <laughs> um, you know, right. you're not going to get married. And the amount of people that reached out to me after that was like uh, thanking me as if I did this huge. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I, uh, I, was, I uh, put out a message that uh anyone want to help me make an event in crown heights oh that's how it started i remember yeah. seeing that event you did ibs yeah. or something yeah and there was like there was 150 people that showed up that they're they have a friend you know that has uh the the disease you know um but a, a, another person came to me that that she wanted to she keeps her medicine in her shaitel box her parents told her not to say anything to her her husband her husband and um they're married for two years and she wanted to talk to think about ways that she could break it to her husband that she literally like told her husband i'm going shopping with my mother and really the mother is bringing her to get a procedure done a little surgery or like something wow, done uh, about this horrible and what really flares up this disease is keeping things inside oh, interesting. and the anxiety <laughs> and stuff like that. So just just the hushing brings on a flare ups. <laughs> it it's uh yeah. Right. That, so that you know that we were talking about when you hear something, when you hear someone say shh Right, you, that's the time to talk. Yeah. I shared that, that that's the reason I did the TED talk on porn addiction was because originally I was gonna do it at a mic drop event with um, with my company, and I mentioned it to Rosh, who Rosh Lowe, who was, you know, he and I were doing mic drop together, and he was the guy who was pulling old stories out of people for 20 years. He's on the news, tell this story and that story, and you know, then within the community, tell all your stories, and people were saying wild, like unbelievable stories. Yeah, and I told him, he's like, Ellie, do you have your topic you want to talk about? And ironically, the year before we had done it two years in my company, the year before I think I spoke about. I did a fake proposal to my then girlfriend, eventual wife. At the time, people thought I was <laughs> fake proposal. <laughs> a fake proposal, like a fake color war breakout. Like I geared up as if I was going to oh, propose, wow. and I think I tied my shoe or something. Oh, you people bad. thought it was horrible. Yeah, very terrible. But I proposed. <laughs> I already had the ring at that time. I proposed like a few days later. Uh. But um, meaning, so I I pulled one of. Uh, your stunts, more of a comedic, a yeah. comedic stunt that fell flat. Yeah, you're a comedian. <laughs> uh, no, you're a closeted comedian. <laughs> it fell flat. Yeah. I was like, all right, I'll go to more serious stuff. And then, um, I said to Rosh, for this year, I want to talk about my struggle with porn addiction and overcoming porn addiction. And he's like, you can't talk about that. And it was the same thing, like, shh, you can't talk about that. Like you too, like et tu brute, like you too. You're you're telling me I can't talk. Everyone says that. How can you? you're Rosh Lowe? You're the guy who's promoting stories. He's like Ellie, you're the CEO of this company. You're gonna 
you're going to embarrass yourself and tell a story? I'm like, you're right. I'm not going to embarrass myself there. I'll do it on the biggest stage I know. Meaning if Rosh Lowe can tell me that something wow. has to be quiet, yeah, and it's not know. enough to do it in front of two, 300 people. This has to be done at the Yeah, and the, so, the so many stage. people got a lot of help from that. You know, right. People that I've heard. Yeah, yeah I, still, I, I still get uh, messages from uh, people, Jewish, non-Jewish alike. I mean, it's got millions of views and a lot of people stuck in that. And it's the same, you know, the same thing. It's the, the shame that seems to it's come shame. along. Yeah. With like you got of... like uh, Mayor Kay. Um, I think he's going to have a tough time with Shaduchim after your, uh, your episode with him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was with him yesterday. Yeah. And uh, he said to me that since the conversation, which he was, he was very skeptical um, about. And he said, since that conversation, he was skeptical about releasing it. And at the end of it, we had a, a conversation where we, sh- like we stopped the cameras and we turned it back I on. I love we that. Shared some yeah. of the, you know, some of his feelings, the moment. And uh, he said that since that um, interview, he's had a lot of people come to him for his breath work, work like many, many people yeah. reach out. And I think that people, they see the realness. And it connects. No one wants to go to the perfect healer. What, how are you going to understand me? Yeah. I think people, people appreciate real. Absolutely. And while we're talking about Mayor, he's got a, there's a lot of good healers. Mayor's got a gift. He'll be, uh, yeah. he's got the, that indescribable healing quality that just. Yeah. And he's, he's got a, so much energy. Yes. <laughs> so yes. you could borrow a little bit of that energy from him. Me? <laughs> I'm saying anybody. The, oh, anyone. The viewer. Can. Yeah. Oh. If you could get a little bit of that energy, you know. Right. And it, it was actually, it's, it's funny you say that because I've done breath works with a lot of people, a lot of different breath works, some private, some groups. And I, I've done all sorts of, you know, different healing modalities. And I've been twice with Mayor in a group, both times very large, which I think feeds, you know, to it, like that kind of energy. But he hypes up the crowd and it allowed for a much different level of, I, I don't know, I don't want to say a different level, but something very different than I experienced from others where this would come in heavy and serious and solemn and, you know, we're healing now. And Mayor's like, we're healing now, you know? Yeah, yeah. And there's, he's not too, he's, you know, appropriate with it, but yeah. enough that during it, he amps it up. His music is a little bit louder. His music is a little bit more uh, energized. So it's like feeding off some of that energy. And somehow it allowed, uh, it allows for- uh, Yeah, you know, I'm definitely going to go to one of his, uh, after I saw that, I was like, okay. He's been telling me about this for a while. I got to go. Yeah, I spoke to someone today. I've never done it with him, so I can't um, promote it. But I spoke to someone today who did a uh, a virtual with him, like over Zoom, and they said it was very powerful. Wow. So that's pretty cool. Okay. Anyway, Mayor, you have to pay for that. So this yeah. is like an ad, basically. <laughs> this has been sponsored by <laughs> Mayor's Breathwork. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I'm a, I'm a fan. When I'm a fan, I talk about it. So how do we went off on some? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know where we <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about the um the, the shame, the shame. So I was yeah. saying, like, uh, you know, that's why I said you're ruining Mayor's shidduch uh, chances. Oh, you know? right, but, yeah, exactly. And I don't know what his shidduch chances <laughs> yeah, are, yeah. <laughs> but certainly in terms of other things, I think people, uh, yeah, people receive it well. As so I'll tell you a story about Mike Chop, which is a funny, funny story. So we were getting a little bit of criticism, especially when we had women talking. Right, God forbid. So it got people fired up. I actually did not, um, I, I didn't fight it when the community, we weren't trying to pitch it to the community. We were doing trainings in companies and other places. And for whatever reason, within the Jewish community, a few people got on board. But the business plan was actually to bring a product to a service to a business for team building. And uh, we did work at large companies, banks, and, you know, smaller companies, and it's a really great team building exercise because that's what I experienced first in my company was saying, hey, these people I've worked with for years, we told our story together and Rosh did that training and we learned things about each other and connected in ways that a lot of other things didn't work. So that was really what it was, a team building. And somehow it caught on within uh, the Jewish community and some people started doing it. I think Srili Richler did it for his company as a team building. And then after that, it kind of, hey, we want to do it too. We want to do it as well. And then there were some women's uh, groups which came together, and then you know the Rabbanim came out. We we didn't fight back. It was uh, I think appropriate. To, right. I don't. Th- you didn't do it in in a spiteful manner. It, it was like uh, 
like anything you do is is not someone from the outside trying to attack the inside it's someone from the inside that's trying to heal the inside you know in this case i wasn't even doing that like jcw was oh, you are <laughs> no jcw is yeah. geared towards a community right mic drop was a business that was going and up until covid you know it was a business and as part of its services it did a couple of events for uh, within oh, the I jewish see. community i didn't realize but that. it wasn't we weren't targeting the jewish community it wasn't it happened to be businesses that we knew. So we had an event in New Jersey with a Syrian company I know, and they had a lot of their employees talk stage. Shirley Richler did it, and he did it in the uh, with his company. I forget the name of his company. And five or six guys did it. Uh, with the, I forget the name of the building right across from 770, Gem maybe or something. So they did it there at the museum. And after that, it kind of caught on, but it wasn't business plan it wasn't profitable it wasn't it wasn't anything but it made a lot of noise and for me it was okay there's no reason to fight because this clearly is going to stir up a lot of things and i don't know if there's enough therapists in the community <laughs> to deal with we need more the therapists answer. but there was an individual um who reached out to me so the, the, there was this like little war that went on on col live where people were writing articles and were writing back and there was one guy i don't know from australia who wrote like something negative. I checked his workbook and these guys are a cult or whatever else. You know, and I wrote back amongst other things that you know, this guy did such a great investigation. He never called us. He never wow. asked us a question. He never did anything. So I don't yeah. know. Like he wants to call himself some sort of professional. This was done very un unprofessionally. Yeah. And I think COL posted my response. I've since taken it taken it down, but it was it was biting for sure. And a lot of his criticism was about a workbook that we provided. People and he said this violates HIPAA laws. These were prompts for people to write and take home with them. It wasn't, right. oh, come check it in. We're scanning it into our files so we know. Well, what do you think was that the source of that resistance to tell people telling their stories and you know? Helping I, I think I, I think people were worried about what was going to come out with good reason. Mm. With good reason. So there was there was a lot that could have come out very fast. And not that that can't bring profound healing, but sometimes it's too much too fast. You don't do surgeries on 20 parts of the body at the same time. Right, right, right. So, you know, with child sex abuse, it was very contained. And over here, it was spreading a little bit like wildfire, where sometimes someone can jump on board with it without really thinking of the consequences. They're, they're doing it because another 10 friends did it. So there was a social kind of element that was, that was um, catching on, which was dangerous. And I think it was the right move that it didn't. It didn't spread like that kind of contagion, right. where some people would have jumped into things that they weren't necessarily. Um, they weren't ready for. Prepared for them yeah. or their families. Sometimes it needs to be, but okay, go in and understand, you know what you're doing. It's yeah. Like like psychedelics. Like so, oh my ten friends at ayahuasca, I'm going to do it too, dude. You're not going to be the same afterwards. You're going to yeah. see a lot of things. Just know what you're going into, and if that's what you want. Yeah, it's not something that you try. Psychedelics. Well, exactly. It's not something like oh let me let me uh, let me try it out. Right, for fun. We'll go to this restaurant on Wednesday, and yeah. you know, on Thursday we'll go there. Yeah, right. it's something you know with prof very profound intention, understanding what it is one's looking to get from it, and then going in. And kind of the same thing if you're going to put out your story in front of the whole world, like just with intention, like you know, two years deliberating, right? Yeah. Not because ten friends did it. Hey, I'm going to do it also. Yeah. Anyway, so a gentleman by the name of Rabbi Mayor Kessler called me, and he said, uh, "I wrote an article." about mic drop because I'm extremely unimpressed or disappointed with what you're doing. But I saw your criticism of the other guy who um, who you said he didn't even call you. So I'm giving you the courtesy of calling you before I post the article. So I said, okay, so we're done or you have a question? <laughs> like, is that like if you're done, I can post yeah. it? So we spoke. And after 45 minutes, an hour, he asked me if I would speak at his next um, retreat, and since then we have a nice relationship. But I've spoken at a few of his uh, his retreats, and I I think that likely right the well intentioned ones. And Mayor Mayor Kessler is very well intentioned and is coming from a place of wanting to help and heal and everything else. But there was something he saw that he ascribed a negative intention to. But when he spoke to me, he saw that wasn't there. I wonder have have you had a, a number of those conversations with people who've criticized. Have you had any of those, or has it yeah. just been? Yeah, the, the, like one example is someone was uh, uh, on Twitter, someone that I respect, 
a fellow comedian that came out very strongly against it. Um, so I messaged him a response like, call me. And I spoke to him for an hour. There's certain like details and certain things behind this that I can't talk about. And, you know, I trust him. I know him. So I told him the full story and, and what was done uh, behind the scenes to make sure that uh, we crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's and right. all the sensitivities. And then he went back on Twitter, a lot of respect. And he said, I, I changed my position. I support it. And he, uh, he even deleted his other tweets. I, I told him, I understand based on your limited knowledge, how you could be triggered by that. And, you know, and it came out that in that way, I didn't take it personal at all. Um, but uh, I, you know, I appreciated the fact that he actually called me. We spoke for an hour. So yeah. let's see how much of that we can, um, like rebuild here in this okay. conversation. I know that some of it, like you said, you trusted him and you were giving him one-on-one -on -one information. But where did he start out? What was his? Do you remember his his original post? What was his original criticism? So uh, a big thing is that this. And is, I want to be clear. Yeah. For me, I have no interest in. This is not about defending you or the criticism. It's actually that someone doesn't see something. And if they're interested in understanding more, so information is for that person. Some haters going to hate. Yes, there are a few of those, which that's their right. business, that's their occupation, and they can do that. We're not talking to those. I saw a lot of people change their mind more from, like they started off supportive and then yeah. some professionals came out, they went the other way. But I had a number of conversations with people where they changed their minds. So I just want to be clear, there's not a defensive question like, oh, defend yourself from the criticism. It's more for those who actually are well-intentioned and like this comedian who you said you respect, who he had a certain perspective and what was that? And in the conversation, what were you able to share with him and how much of that can we right. recreate? So I'll, I'll, first of all, a lot of the people uh, that, were messaging me after the video came out uh were in support and and then once uh you know some of these professionals and you know influencers posted negativity i think a lot of people had all these emotions and then once it was put into words by someone that they respect someone that they follow then it, it kind of helped them channel that into that direction and then it it kind of shifted the wind to the feedback being negative. So the vocal feedback. The vocal negative. feedback, yeah, yeah. Right, that's, that's what I saw happen, is that it became kind of the zeitgeist to be against. If you were, um, if you were for, then you were already almost starting in a defensive yeah. position. Yeah, yeah. But meaning there were still plenty of people, and there are still plenty of people, and I've gotten messages, and you've gotten messages with very specific things, not, hey, that made me feel good, but this is something good that came out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So the, in, in the real, like off of the internet in, in the real world, um, there's a lot of surprisingly more than I expected, even though I've been in this business for a while. Um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, survivors that confided in me, told me their story. Um, even, uh, bringing up new names of, of people one one was actually in a school and since then he was removed and wow. and dealt with um the principal messaged me like you don't know how many kids you've saved well wow. um so just seeing like very quickly people getting healing people bringing things up that it's right, safe to talk about things. yes right. and we did have a trigger warning right i think the problem is that there are way too many trigger warnings. So maybe, people right, are, you exactly. know, like they, it's, it's like you click on it, like, okay, I accept, I accept. I'm not going to read all the legal stuff. Right. You know, it could be some people went through that. And maybe we should have done a, a real trigger warning, a stronger trigger warning that right. if I did it again, I'd probably do a, a more in depth, spent more time about the trigger warning. Cause yeah, it is, it is it's very true. triggering. Yeah. I didn't think of that. Is that so many people say trigger warnings and it's like, oh, okay, that was, that was, yeah. Yeah, for, for anyone that's sensitive to plants, there's a trigger warning that we're talking about right. plants in this episode. You know? <laughs> right. Or it could actually be about sexual abuse and yeah. then very lightly touch it. There are yes. very few things that, I mean, I've, I've seen very few things that touch it the way this, yeah. this does. The, like this the, needed a... The trigger warning was, was meant to be there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But realizing that it's, it needs to be 
reinforced. Yeah. yeah. That's a, yeah. Sometimes like Google will do that. Well, you know, they'll put like, this is not the legal stuff. This is something simple. You, you should read it, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You know, my, like my take, which I shared, um, on Instagram at the time when I saw this stuff going on was that, yeah, there are some things, some negative stuff that come along with it for sure. For sure. There's going to be some people who, who were hurt or, you know, it wake something, wake something up taken by surprise. There's all sorts of may, maybe someone else gets excited by it in some way and they're watching and get a couple of tips. Yeah. There are things that can happen, but by and large, the sickness wants this kept secret and the health the way we get healthy around this is by bringing yeah. it out as much as possible. And when you get an opportunity like this to share it, like you said, straight from the horse's mouth, and then you yeah. know, watch it if you watch it if you dare, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, if, if to, it's, it's too much, don't watch it. And and it definitely, I think it definitely saved lives, you know. And uh, and that's what that's right. why I posted it. And because I, I that's the only justification thought, yeah. too, because even at the end of the day, this guy's a person, you know, as much as we want to dehumanize him, he's a person with a life and everything else. He has kids, he has a wife, he has family. And their only real justification to t take someone, and he doesn't seem to have noticed the blowback it was going to bring to himself and his, his family. Um, and he may still not notice it. Nevertheless, I think you and I do, and you know, the average person looking at this understands that this came at a significant price. And the only justification would be that it does save lives, that it does yeah. give the opportunity to heal for some people who are in a very difficult place and prevent this from happening in the, uh, yeah. in the future. And, and, and uh, one or two abusers actually reached out. Um, wow. And they want to get help. Wow. So, uh, and, and they, you know, that, that'll definitely save people as well on that on that line yeah. you know so it, it gave it gave courage for people to talk about it i mean listen you know like we're down here in life for a very limited amount of time and we're like so careful about trying to keep everything all mm -hmm. you know like those people they buy their phone and they leave that plastic mm -hmm. on you know like they have to keep it i'm like no use the thing <laughs> peel it off peel it off use it right, so if it breaks it. get another <laughs> one we don't have much time. <laughs> like, why are we tiptoeing around here? You know, I don't, I don't understand it. Yeah. To me, another thing about this is that child sex abuse is not a. There's the abuser and the victim, and those are the only two people involved. And you know, like some of the feedback was, you know, we need survivors talking, not perpetrators. And who are you to have this conversation? You know. Not yeah. knowing that you had ir irritable bowel, bowel syndrome. <laughs> 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 Who are you to have this conversation? Whatever it is. And yeah. to me, it's like, we are all victims of sexual abuse. Like, what I mean by that is that collectively. these things, yeah, collectively, yeah. the way these things affect the community, the ways it affects the trust. Uh, uh, there's a, sto a story I shared um, a few weeks ago, which even like being steeped in this conversation, I continue to learn new things and I'm surprised by it. But someone, um, share with me that a, who was sexually abused, that a sibling of theirs went through a, a deep healing process. And the, what came, they were going through something in their life, struggling in some way, and they said, okay, I, I really need to do some, some healing. Um, it's affecting my, my kids, my marriage, my, my health. And what was the trauma that this person was bearing was that as a child, they knew that their younger brother was getting sexually abused. and they felt a guilt. They didn't understand what was happening. They just knew there was something bad and they were trying to stop it. But they said at one point, um, she knocked on the door when the abuse was going, like when abuse was going on and she was told no, no girls allowed. And she, she felt carrying it through, I mean, now to her 40s, that she didn't do enough to prevent her sibling from getting abused. And at the time, there were just feelings. But as her siblings started, her brother started dealing with the abuse, it came up for her even more pronounced because, oh, now that's really what was going on. And there was, and I didn't stop it, and I'm the older sibling. So who is the victim of sexual abuse? In some ways, I almost felt worse 
for the sister, in some meaning in aspects of it, in the sense that it could be missed. Yeah. Right. That oh, you weren't the one who got. You weren't the one who was affected. You know, like a family who may have a handicapped child or something. And then yeah, everyone else is affected, but only the handicapped child is getting that level of attention. But it's something that now the whole family is being affected by this. So the secondary trauma victims yeah. don't get the attention. So because of that, in some ways, their problem is is worse. It's like, hey, what about me? Like this has been tough for me as as well. So it was when I heard this story and I heard this story recently, it shook me. I was like, wow. The 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 effects of sexual abuse are widespread. And then if you think about someone who abuses and then their family knowing about it or even sometimes not knowing about it, just it's there. It's there. So to me, everyone gets to talk about this. Like who is the victim and who is the abuser? As a community, as a world, we are dealing with this problem. In the Jewish world, it's been a massive problem, not so much because of the frequency, but because of the shame and secrecy around it. Yeah. And... Now, if someone wants to talk, yeah, by all means, like you don't have to listen. But also, get up but and talk. Like if yeah. everyone is a victim of this. Yeah. Everyone is a victim of this. Yeah, hundred percent. We do. You could save people. There's not much. You know, you, you have not that much to lose if uh, if you deal with this uh, thing that's haunting our community and a lot of communities. Not just specific to the Jewish community. No, it's, it's not a lot. You know, it's. Uh, no. Uh, we we happen there there is the big elephant in the room that the the way the system is set up you know you go through puberty and then you're supposed to you know wait until 20 something before you uh, get sexual and that's a uh you know that's a big elephant in the room and we we spoke about it dr solomon right uh i was very surprised he came up with something very simple he's like exercise these teenagers that are in right, school, there's so much energy, and you're yeah, not letting you get out like, anyway. Like they're, if they're in, they're over a book all day, all day, all day, all day. Plus, they have to refrain from giving in to their urges. It's a recipe for disaster. At least give them an outlet to exercise, to some some kind of outlet like that. Yeah, you know, what like, I find the real recipe for disaster is yes, that's something, but then not being able to talk about it even, yeah, and then feeling shame, yeah. You know, I, the amount of 18, 19, 20 year olds who've reached out to me about uh, struggling with watching pornography. And sometimes, you know, I'll say like, how often do you watch? I always ask the question, how often do you watch? It's like, oh, like, you know, I didn't watch for a few months, but last week I did and I'm feeling terrible. I'm like, and you feel bad. At, <laughs> like you're yeah. feeling bad about this. Do you understand the world you're growing up in? Who is making you feel bad? I want to know who's the guy. Who's making you feel bad? Is it some 50-year-old Rebbe? Six-year-old Rebbe? He doesn't know your struggle. The iPhone came out in 2007. Yeah. He doesn't know your struggle of needing to, to, in order to get pornography, you had to go to a bodega and- That's Monsieur you know, Snefish. What? To then- get, To get pornography Right back now, then, yeah. so you're bumping into it. You're literally yeah. bumping into it. You know, my yeah. wife the other day, she put in a, some website and she's like, whoa. She meant it was a company name, but she spelled that like one T off and all of a sudden she was on, a, yeah. um, on some sort of porn site. So I didn't see it. I didn't relapse. I'm still sober. You can still listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, meaning it's, it, c- it can come at you. And then yeah. in that environment, this guy is, uh, I'm not saying every few months okay or not okay. I'm not giving a, I'm just saying that the fact that he feels so to alone. To talk about the struggle. In his struggle. Yeah. And not he feels so alone. He feels like a bad person. Yeah. Guilty. You know, someone told me recently, I got a message and he said that his health issues and he's convinced the health issues are because I think he had a stroke, like it was something serious, because he watches porn. And I said, but if, if that's the case. But that'd be a lot of stroke victims. A lot more stroke victims. Stroke victims. Yeah. yeah, it'd be a lot more stroke victims. So that's the piece that I see that is the real destruction. Meaning, yes, you have the energy, the, the energy, there's no energy outlet and everything else, but we also can't even talk about it. Yeah. And then just what someone is experiencing, they're told they're a bad person for it. Yeah, it's great. It's- I'll, I'll bring back the irritable bowel disease uh, right. example. So, when I was younger and I was diagnosed, and I was, uh, you know, it was it's a pretty crappy thing to have, pun intended. And, <laughs> uh, but it was also I felt like I was the only one. Like I, I, we didn't talk about it, you know. I, and I was at a friend's house, 
and I saw some colazole, which was a medication, on the counter there. This is a medication that I take. And just seeing that on like in the open, the counter, I was like, wow. Wow, this oh, is amazing. Yeah. The fact that this person is Yeah. I went I, I went over to the bottle, I opened it up, I took a couple, I put it in. They're like, no, 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 don't take that. <laughs> I was like, what well, is vitamin C, no? <laughs> Um, right. but, uh, it was, it was so, um, such an amazing feeling. Okay. There's, there's another person I think that may be going through this, you know? Yeah. We hired a, uh, a new guy for our podcast and he was talking, he was like, Hey, like, what do you think a tagline should be and everything else? I said, I don't know what taglines, but you know, I talk longer than time. I have two hour conversations. Also put something in five words. So I said, but the concept that I think of what we're trying to do here is just give permission to humans to have a human experience because so many of us are going through that experience and then we feel horrible and we don't know that everyone is going, going through that. Yeah. Mayor Kay told me the amount of people who reached out to him who said, thank you for talking about this religious doubt. I have it too. So it's one thing to have religious doubt. It's another thing to have religious doubt alone. And yeah. with everything, it's one thing to have irritable bowel syndrome. It's another thing to have it alone. It's nothing yeah. to be sexually abused. It's nothing to be going at it alone. And that's, and that we can change just by it's human. People talk about it. Yeah, we're having human experience. Yeah, I I think there's so much that we just do as a traumatic response collectively from the generation. If you think about it, after the Holocaust, you know, we were worried about becoming um, extinct. Extinct. So, you know, like a lot of the Hasidim went on the approach of creating this cocoon this bubble to protect us so that we don't become extinct chabad went the opposite approach went on the offensive to not become extinct but it was all related survival strategy yeah it was all a survival strategy and i for the first time in a long time we have an opportunity to take a deep breath and like okay what in the world are we doing here and why are we doing it and and it's messing with a lot of people's heads. Right. And it's important to talk about it and figure it out. Okay, what's, you know, sift through it. What's a traumatic response? What is not? What's helpful? What's not? And, right. you know. It's one of, the, one of the challenges in a religious community is that everything is given sacredness. It's, it's sometimes hard to differentiate. You know, I... I you had your kids in lamplighters. I was a supporter of lamplighters. And that was one of the things I loved about it is that, so, oh, you can't have schools like this. Why not? Tell me why not. Why, who said no? Like, all we've done is take schools from 100 years ago that were the standard. They were the standard then. And now we're doing it now. Yeah. And a fedora, I don't know if you know this, was the common attire for men in the 1940s. There was nothing holy about it. It was just the common hat that everyone wore. And let me tell you something, in Russia, it's a little bit colder, so they wore these big fur ones. And I'm not saying we should or shouldn't continue doing this, but to ascribing sacredness only to that and nothing else, and we, we multiply that by many other things, thought patterns and ways of talking and so behaving, and come on, there's, yeah. there's nothing sacred about this. And a lot of them are actually just beer knuckle survival strategies, which the only reason you would crouch in a corner like that is because the Nazis are coming and now they're not. Yeah. So stand up and live your life. You're exactly. Free. You're free right. to ask questions. Right. That was our to way. Talk about it. Right. Yeah. That was our way always. That's how we survive. We're in the Gemara. Like learning in the Gemara, they ask every single question you can think of till they exhaust a topic. And then it's like, okay, now you stumped us, take it, right? Every once in a yeah. while, right? Okay, Elijah's yeah. going to come back and tell us the answer to that one. We don't know. But they exhaust the topic from 80 different ways. But somehow, if we ask the question, you know, what do you mean God's hand? God has a hand, you know? And yeah. God's hand took it as it did Egypt. It was the right hand. What are you, what, oh, what are you saying? And yeah, we, we, this is a luxury right now. We could afford to think, okay, what, what was like the Baal Shemt of thinking when he created this whole new way of reinvigorating living as a jew to to uh because it became it started becoming just robotic and it was all the traditions were getting you know were 
you're missing the point. Right. And uh, and so we got this new, fresh way. <laughs> and then that, amazingly, God bless our very, very smart professionals, were able to take that passion and put it down into exact words so that it's, it becomes robotic again. I know. And now we're back to square one. This is everywhere. Everything becomes a religion. Everything. It's like we turn, we take God, turn to religion. Who told me it was uh, Reb Chase Taub? Like he said to me, he said, Mestagdim serve Shulchan Aruch, and Chassidim serve God. Right? It's not. Yeah. Many Chassidim are serving Shulchan Aruch also. But he said, like his point was that, you know, we, we start going after the, the book and like lose the whole spirit. You know, it's like, exactly. what, what is there? You know? The, I think that the, the, the Rebbes, the Rabbeim, they had a lot of faith in us to feel, to sit, meditate, and feel Hashem, and to follow that, and, uh, and encourage the feeling. Right, and you could, if God is in everything, you could find God everywhere. Doesn't yeah. mean you should go everywhere, right? There's certain places that are yeah. kind of mucky, right? So it's, it's not for the faint of heart, right? We can go in. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't wish sexual abuse on anyone, but I found God in my sexual abuse, right? Meaning I found a lot of my meaning and purpose, and uh, I, I see it as a very purposeful event in my life. Like I found God there. That's a little bit harder to find God there than it is, you know, standing yeah. in Machu Picchu. But we could find God everywhere. And then people start going on a path that's slightly different. They're wearing a pink shirt, I'm wearing white pants, and it's like, oh, these guys are not part of the chill out. Like, <laughs> really, really chill out. It's not about that. It's not about that. There may be some social reasons to have, a, to have, to have those things. But as far as God, as far as the, you know, what we're doing here, it's not about that. Yeah. Preach it, Ellie. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I... I um I have nothing left to say. I, I do yeah, wanna sure. um I started this conversation talking about You have the water over there. Oh, okay. I have you have okay. a bottle by you also. Oh okay, thanks. I'm gonna I'm Unless gonna take some water. This. Take your time. Okay. Yeah, we went off on a little bit of a um Jewish yeah. religious thing, which is fine. Um, but let me ask you that then. Is, sure. As part of this, what you were doing, did you feel God in that? Did, did you feel that you were being called to do something, like to, to bring something godly into the world with this one? Yeah, 100%. It was, it was a, a place that came from beyond logic. I was just doing a show at an event, and this guy was there. And it was, it, it hit me the wrong way that he's just sitting right in the middle, you know, laugh, the, the laugher of the audience, the guy laughing a little louder than everyone else, you know? And, and you uh, said he was sitting smack in the middle. Smack in the middle. Yeah. And I was like, no shame. I was like, right. Yeah. So bracing, right. And, uh, and so I, I, I spoke to him afterwards, um, with a friend and, uh, and he was he was talking about why he was there and everything like that and and it just was like hey let's just uh um have this on video let's talk about it you know i just i just kind of went with it you know sometimes it, you think you you show up one place for right. a reason i went to that show you know and and everything else just planned it out hashem just has you know these things that are beyond logic and uh, if you tune into it right it's there yeah you you shared with me offline yeah. i'm not sure if you're comfortable doing it yeah um here is that the timing of the release of the video was connected to um a brother of yours who passed yeah um when i when i spoke to the the second victim and and the struggles that uh that she's been going through through her, her teenage years it it, it actually gave me flashbacks to my brother and his struggles um and and it it just coincidentally happened to be his yard site 
Can you talk a little bit to his story? Are you comfortable talking about that? Um, I mean, it, it's, uh, he, he had a, uh, a, a rough journey. He was, he was not that much a comedian. Older brother, younger brother? He was an older brother. Got it. Um, and, and I, I kind of took the role of a caretaker, um, when he went through, uh, addiction and, um, he went through a lot of different, uh, um, a lot of different uh, dark places and different countries. So when your countries. father passed, he took it. Yeah. So so I I I uh, he took it a lot more hard yeah, than he took it a lot a lot harder. Right. That's what you meant. There wasn't a comedian. He didn't have a a tool to help navigate the pain. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. It was very very hard on him. And um. And and so I I, I assumed the role of uh of of helping him out and um. And so, um, and, uh, and, and it, uh, that, and he took passed a, away from addiction related issues. Yes. Got it. Yeah. And, uh, that, that took, um, it was, I think it was a clear signal. It was not a coincidence that, that on his yard site, someone was redeemed by something that I did. Right. Yeah, I'm not used to talking about this stuff. <laughs> right, I can see. <laughs> um, it's not it's not that much uh, humor involved in that. Uh, um, but I I definitely have gotten a lot of help um, over overcoming. I I would say understanding. And and overcoming my brother's loss through psychedelics. Oh, interesting. And um, it 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 like it gave me a a completely different perspective. Different perspective. Is that is that something you can put in words? Like where were you before the psychedelics and how it helped? Um, I would I would put it like a some sort of a like a cloud. Uh, um, and I was not aware that it was because of his loss that I was in walking around in this cloud. And so it was affecting you in ways that you weren't completely acknowledging. A hundred percent. Right. And um, and and when I went into the journey, I thought I would be dealing with other stuff. Right. <laughs> and um. And that was, uh, it, it was, it was incredible. If I, if I talk about it, people are going to think I'm crazy, no, but they already think, so. think I'm crazy, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, just, no, I think if you talk about it, people will think you're real. Yeah. It just, yeah. Uh, I, I was able to spend time with my brother. In the, uh, in the experience. Yeah. It, it gave a certain awareness that you learn on the books all this stuff of the different realms and and I kind of wanted to buy into it but I I was sold right you know what's so interesting someone someone on the outside would not understand this it wouldn't make any sense to them is that chabad and chassidus is steeped in mysticism it's a jewish mystical tradition so if you say that you are chabad and you have to preface that you felt like you were with your brother, with you're going to think I'm crazy. The person who's going to think you're crazy is the one looking out the outside, and he's going to think, like, what is, aren't you part of a Chabad mystical tradition? Why did you have to preface it by saying, yeah. two days ago, um, my family went to the, the oil, the first, to the oil, was all the first time I took my, my kids there. And you see the amount of people who are coming to, at a gravesite to, to pray. And there's this sense or this idea that something is happening there. Many people are writing letters uh, to to the Rebbe and suggesting that there's some sort of divine communication that's coming coming back to them. But still, being steeped in those traditions, this is very similar to what you were saying, we've stripped out so much of the meaning of it. It's we're going to a gravesite, we're writing a letter to a book, we're, we're swinging chickens over our head, we're, we're doing these things. And because we've been doing it since we're two or three, we think it's normal. Yeah. 
And suddenly someone says, I felt like I was with my brother, thinks, oh, you've never heard of this one. You've just been throwing your sins to the fish. You've never heard of this idea. So you think it's crazy. But actually, no, we're a, we're, we're a tradition of Jewish mystics, and we shouldn't be afraid to say that. Yeah. Wow, it's amazing how you have like a lot of words for this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of feeling towards it, and I'm not as good as uh, articulating it, but... Uh... Your, your journey has definitely led you to be able to articulate this, which is incredible. It's a gift for people that are still listening. And I said, very few people listen. So <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to worry about it. Let's yeah. just get to the end to see it, get to the good stuff. Yeah. So what's interesting is two parts. Number one is when I told you the story of the um, boy who was sexually abused and their sibling who took responsibility for that, I mentioned that whole concept of the secondary trauma you seem to agree in some way do you feel like with your brother's death like in some way it wasn't only the death right it was the addiction and the caretaking and all of that over the years do you feel like you you were a, a victim i don't want to use that word for like the identity purposes but just for the uh articulating the point do you feel like you were a victim of secondary trauma in terms of that 100 percent a hundred percent. It was definitely, uh, it, there were a lot of effects from his life that, you know, trickle over to me. Can, can you speak to that? Because I was fascinated by the previous story of the abuse was something that I learned new right. very recently. Well, I mean, just think about the, uh, after he passed away, I just could not forgive myself. Like I felt responsible. Oh, you took responsibility for yeah. it. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. Because I had that role. And I felt like if only I would have, you know, I, I got married, I was busy with the kids, I, I, I didn't give them enough attention. If only just, you did a little yeah, more. exactly. Wow. And, you still uh, feel that way? No. Huh. No. I, that was some of the cloud that the... That, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and just to see him so happy right now, you know. Oh, like, I mean, you had a sense that he's okay Yeah, now. that he's good. Like, he's right. really good. You know, it was just like, and it, it was just... It was knowing it, like feeling right. it, and knowing like he Experiencing is. Experiencing it, yeah. And he's he and and he is uh, his soul, his energy is is still here, and it was just, yeah, it was incredible. Right. Funny because yeah. it's literally the same exact as the story I said, taking responsibility for what happened to to another person. In yeah. this case, even more because it's the actions of an adult but you took responsibility for the actions. 100%. Okay. I mean, to give you an example of, of that type of thing, my oldest brother, um, when I was a kid, he asked me uh, for some of my super snack. I had, a, mm -hmm. I had the family pack, you mm -hmm. know, the, the like uh, dipsy doodle, no, no the, the, uh, the twirls, mm -hmm. whatever it's called. You know, these- uh, The barbecue. Remember? Yeah, the it's barbecue just, twists yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and he's like, oh, I'm going to the park. I'm going on a trip, you know, or, you know, like, uh, could I, could I have some? And I was thinking like, oh, I'm also going on a trip. Like, uh, like I was like, no, no, I need this, you know? And then I came home and, uh, I heard that like, he didn't like the lunch. And so he was starving. He didn't eat anything all day. So when he came to me for the super snack, he didn't eat anything like that would have been the food. And like even uh, thinking about it for years, it like wow. it ate me up. Like wow. like why didn't I give him the super snack? Wow. <laughs> uh -huh. and, so, and what do you, and what do you do with it now? So now I I I kind of look at it as uh, an adult talking to a kid that um, it's like you you had a limited amount of information. It wasn't your job to feed him. And, you know, take it easy. I was speaking to someone not long ago who's told me that uh, their father also passed away young. And he said as a joke, like several weeks before his father passed, he said Kaddish. And he just thought it would be funny. As a kid. I think it's dark humor. Said, yeah. And um, till today, he feels like he killed his father, I would say. Wow. Till today, he feels that way. Unbelievable.
And he was young, young, young. I mean, under 10 when, uh, when this happened. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. and when he said it, I was like, you're not reporting something from, you're not reporting an old feeling. That's a, that's yeah. a feeling now. You still wonder. And he said, yeah, that's maybe one day we'll get him on the, yeah. the chair. But it's, it's fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. When you get to, uh, when you get speaking to people about these things, like I often do, is, is how these seemingly tiny things can sit with someone and they'll rack their heart and mind for decades yeah. over these things and wreck their life over the, the smallest thing. And until they can bring it up and talk about it, it doesn't even stand a chance of getting healed. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, Maybe the best thing is to yeah. bring it to light. Yeah, you know? bring it to light. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes a little... The reason why I'm sharing about the psychedelics, I, I don't really share about it publicly, of how it helped. Um, it's just because yesterday, uh, I remembered that there's a friend I know that could really, that really, really, uh, like he needs it. He needs that. And so I, uh, I haven't seen him in a, in, in a while. He lives in a foreign country. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I messaged him to, uh, to check in on him, to tell him, you know, like to explore psychedelics. Right. And he's like, dude, (laughs) it's like, I'm way ahead of you. (laughs) He, not only did he explore it, um, he, before his profession is in a medical lab doing research on medication after he went through his journey. That's what he's working in now. Right. He's he's doing research in psychedelics. Right. He, like he said, it was the most. Uh, the, the it was an experience that had the biggest impact in his life, um, in a good way. No, it has a profound, yeah. profound, profound capacity to heal, and there aren't there aren't words that can yeah um, explain it. And while I I still don't think spiked the Kool Aid, you know the way. Certain people in the 70s felt like just everyone needs to take this and the right. world will be healed. I think that if someone is entering the healing path serious, seriously, if someone wants that, yeah, you got to go strongly into consider. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got to. I, I, I went on diets. I, I did uh, breathing, meditate, like leading up to it. I, there was a few months leading up to it. It was like, right. not a, I think that's why it was uh, so impactful. No, it's going on. I think the only parallel I have in our lingo for it, and I know we're supposed to say Lahab deal. Yeah. For it. But the only parallel I have for it is Yechidis. Like, I think it's the only, if you want to explain it to someone in a, like, from our background who didn't understand, um, like, oh, what do you mean you take this thing? It's, yeah, you take this thing and you come face to face with yourself, yeah. which is like the only thing I've heard in our thing that does that is that was Yechidis, right? People would come in to a Rebbe who was the idea, Neshama Kalas, right? This, uh, a reflection in some way of every single person, whatever that means. And um, I've heard this from a number of rabbis who understood the rabbi. I never had a yichidus with him, but that yichidus would be a private meeting with him. But that was the, what many people said about it, was that they went in and they saw themselves for the first time. They got an x-ray themselves. And I, you know, I, I can't say this is that because I haven't done both, but the only... The only thing I've heard about in our background that I can use words for that describe what it's like to go into, um, I, I should be, when I say psychedelics, I'm talking about high dose psilocybin and ayahuasca. I think there are a lot of other things that people are calling psychedelics, yeah. which MDMA and ketamine, and they may have some healing properties. We're not talking, when no. I'm talking about yichidus, I'm talking about those, those things. High dose psilocybin in a controlled setting ayahuasca for healing purposes and in those there is you know what is the intention that we're going into something for sets it up a lot and you come face to face with with yourself talk about trigger uh trigger warnings the psychedelics should definitely come with come with a trigger one yeah Yeah, because it it it, um like like anything that a comedian says any content that an artist puts out or anything uh hits people in different ways and triggers people in certain ways and the triggers are kind of sometimes they're gifts because then you know where you're dealing with 
And the thing about psychedelics is that it it could get to a level of triggering that you're you're not aware of at all. And uh and and then you could help deal with it. That's why it's so important to have it to do it as part of a larger therapy. Context, right. Yeah. You you need a but before some, and afterwards you should definitely have I start doing my thing, I'm going along and then one day I pop into a you know a mushroom journey and then Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not gonna, gonna solve your problems. Psychedelics right. is not gonna solve your problems, but it's a tool it as, brings things to as the surface. A, yeah, as as a larger if you are in the healing space and, and speaking to someone and, and getting therapy, this could just supercharge to really see what, what you're working with. And right. then you have to do the work. 100%. Yeah, and breath work as well. Breath work has capacity, but breath work is kind of dictated. You have to continuously make the decision during the breath work experience to keep going in. Once you take your foot off the pedal, then it kind of, whereas you can't undrink ayahuasca so once you chuck it down your <laughs> yeah down your, uh, well you kind of going you kind of undrink it by barfing it up but um, that's a, not what i've seen yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i haven't seen the effect stop when someone barfed it up yeah yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. I know. it's it's in it's in and uh it's going to have the impact it's it's going to, to have what i um often tell people now about it so i get a lot of questions i talk about it publicly is that you want to have made the decision for yourself to go there. I wasn't so sensitive to this previously yeah. because at some point during the experience, most likely, not everyone, some are all blissful, but if someone goes into, let's say, five of these, one of them is for sure going to get you to this moment of why the hell did I decide to do this? And if it's because of some social pressure or some other guy's idea, you're going to hate them in that moment. But if it was because you were determined to get over an addiction or be a better father or be a better spouse or be a better mother, whatever, it is that you said, okay, this is the reason why I want to change something. This is what I want to change, and I'm willing to pay the price for it. Then when you're in that moment, you say, okay, I'm here for my kids. I'm here for my marriage. I'm here for my addiction. I'm here to heal. I'm here for myself, and not I'm here because some dude convinced me to be here. Exactly. What a jackass. Yeah. So just to go back to what my friend, um, the reason why I'm even talking about it publicly yeah. is because two days ago, when I when I reached out to him and he, and he was telling me how important it is for people, especially in the religious community, to not start looking at it as as a uh, you know idol worship or whatever right. it is as treif. Um, he's like people respect you, believe it or not, and he's like he and he doesn't usually talk like this. He's like I think you should publicly tell people about Say it. Something about it yeah. yeah because there's a lot of people that can use use the help right i've seen profound prof profound i've seen um i've seen marriages saved i've seen people who are suicidal who um are no longer in that case and yes it takes work it takes work it brings things to the surface and then it gives someone the opportunity to heal it but without doing the work they'll often go back to i've seen many people who after a psychedelic journey the only thing they were doing is fighting to get back to where they were before it and you can't unsee certain things, so it doesn't work perfectly. But sometimes someone is not ready for that, then they can just want to go back to to that yeah. state. But it does have, for those who are really serious about healing, yes, there are a million different caveats and things to pay attention to, but it must, must, must be strongly considered. And, and yeah, from a uh, religious standpoint, the boogeyman, I, if, if you think about it, if you actually think about it, it's a much riskier thing from a religious perspective to sit someone with a therapist who most likely does not come from your same values, who does not come from the same place, and influence them for a two, three, or four-year period than it is to have them take a psychedelic, which psychedelic means mind manifesting, which is going to take, basically, you're becoming your own doctor in some way. Yeah. You're, you're, you're not, the therapist isn't sitting there telling you what you should think and how you should handle it. It's the cloud is being lifted, like you said, your therapist is, is, oh, I think this is an issue for you, and I think you should deal with it in this way. No, this is you. It's bringing up what's inside of you, and then it's introducing also your way of navigating yeah. through that. Yeah. You know? And I know there are concerns. There are many, many people who will go into this place and um, will appear at first to become less religious, and I think that is a legitimate concerned that people are worried about it. But I would argue that if a little bit of a vegetable or a little bit of a tea 
can throw your whole religion into question, then it's not that deeply rooted. It's not. Right. And I, I think it... And in the long term, right. I've seen people come back to it. And I think it, it unmasks what they... Like, they might dress and be robotically just doing... Correct. ...what their parents want them to do. And then, so they take a step back and they're like, wait a second, I don't even believe in all this. Why am I doing this? And then they can actually do it with meaning and intention. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that's some of the concern, you know, when they say idol worship, I think that some have seen that as how come so many people who do this then start becoming a little bit more relaxed around religion. And the reason is because they weren't doing it for the right reasons often. It's not that deeply right. planted. You didn't really get it to the roots. That was your plan. That was the plan when you were educating them, but it's not what happened. And that's why a little bit of tea. Yeah, I definitely got much, I got much closer. And when you talk and, about these things, like yeah. feeling like you're um, feeling God through experience. Yeah. That's- and a, a side effect, by the way, looping back around uh, to irritable bowel disease, um, it always comes back to that. Yeah. I was able to cut off of all the medication. Wow. Some heavy cancer causing medication. Like literally, it says, you know. Right. One of the side effects um, of cancer. And I needed that medication or else I would have internal bleeding, a lot of bad stuff. And, and the, uh, the, the psychedelics, uh, I think, helped me process things that I was feeling in my gut. And once I was able to process it, I right. took care of it. Yeah, I mean, what is the Sefit Kreva says? A lachen, a cleaner lachen goof is a grace lachen and shama or something like that. Like, there's just a small problem in the body. Yeah. There's a big problem in the spirit. And, uh, you know, psychedelics can heal, heal it on the spiritual level and then sometimes flesh out the, uh, the problem in our body. I think in general, you know, I had, I have irritable bowel syndrome, but I, I was very sensitive to many foods prior to addiction recovery. Mm. And today I'm clearly not. <laughs> <laughs> Right. But I've seen worse. What? Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're you're doing okay. But I'm yeah. I'm not I'm I'm not that way anymore. And I think that there's a lot that gets um, stored in the in the stomach. One of my favorite um, uh, from story, like dysfunctional from stories that I like to say is a gentleman who, when he was learning for his bar mitzvah, learned that you're not allowed to be wearing tefillin if you have to go to the bathroom. So now that's a peculiar state. Do I have to go to the bathroom? Could I go to the bathroom if I went? I don't know, right? He said that from when he began putting on film a little before his 13th birthday until his mid-20s, he never got through a davening without going to the bathroom. And then over time developed a lot of different um, bladder and different you know, issues related to his gut, bladder, et cetera, on several different medications, went to therapy for, I think it was marriage stuff, and the therapist was the first person who told him, you did what? Like, you, you never got through a tefillin? You never got through a davening once because of that, and no one told you that was, that was crazy? And no. And he had many more examples of this, but very extreme um, religious obsession than any other setting, except for someone wearing a mask for two years because of COVID. In any other setting, we would have called it um, some sort of a OCD. Come on, you can't. Yeah. You're really not sure for forty. You can't go forty five minutes without being sure if you like. In every meeting, are you walking out? You go to check if you have to go to the bathroom. This is straight OCD. You locked the door ten times, but it's only because it was viewed in the lens of um, religious adherence that it was missed. Not only missed, it was encouraged. It's like, oh, he's so from. Isn't from? He was struggling. He was struggling heavily. One other, one other things he, he used to do was he used to dry his hands really well before um, Natil Sadaim, right before washing the hands for bread, because it's not supposed to have any moisture. But our hands always have a little moisture. He dried it. To, he had cuts on his hands, oh, literally. Yeah. Sometimes 15, 20 minutes he'd be um, drying his hands. But it wasn't until he went to therapy in his 20s, the guy's like, this is not religion. This is OCD. But somehow it was able to mask it in a way that those around him, instead of calling it out, built it up and said, hey, you're doing something good here. You're being so you know, careful with what it says in, in Jewish law. No, this isn't careful. This yeah. is uh, 
obsessive obsessive compulsive disorder yeah yeah to the extreme yeah and i i think that if if you're if you kind of lose your humanity in judaism you're not doing it right you know if you're if you're if if for every little thing you have to find uh like okay where's it sourced where's the like no this guy is about to get hit by a car don't look in the book just grab him out of the street you <laughs> right. know what i'm saying right we don't have to see what would the rabbit do in this situation like like there's certain things that you're a human and god gives you these intuitions go with it right you know they what to say about pinchas right if he asked the question then obviously he wasn't coming from passion. I mean, if he thought there was a moment that he could delay, then he wasn't coming from a place of, of pure passion. Right? Yeah. A mother's not going to ask, is it okay if I run in the street and save my kid? No, just go run. And you're operating from that place. There's nowhere to, um, there's no, no one to ask and nothing to ask. Just yeah. Go. And that goes into with abuse victims a lot. Uh, did you ask a rabbi if if uh, if you can expose the abuser? Did you uh, did you go to a rabbi first? You know, like there was a lot of that going on, and uh, it's like a, ra- a rabbi. <laughs> like, if someone gets shot, you're gonna go to the rabbi. You know, right? You're saying if someone gets abused to go to a cop. Like, or like, like yeah, yeah. Why, yeah. Why, why is it like that's the first thing? Did you ask? A, I, I got plenty of messages. You ask a rav before putting this out. You know. Right, which you happen to. Yeah, I did. Right. Because there's definitely religious aspects. There's also Chil Hashem involved. There's, there's different things, and I wanted to make sure that it's all, right. you know, it's all okay. vetted. But, um, so what's your issue with the But question? I don't think, but my first... Oh, meaning that was the first that one. Was, yeah, the first one, I, I didn't go to the Rob first. I, I first dealt with the, the, you know, someone at 30 years dealing with... Victims, right, meaning when you, you know? brought up with someone, the first question they ask is there. Not that it's not one of the boxes. Yeah, yeah. Talk, right, I remember talking to someone, and he had called me because he was cheating on his wife with prostitutes. And uh, someone he spoke to thought I can help. So I began talking to him, and I saw like a wall like that I couldn't get through in a conversation. Almost that he didn't, his issue was, not even that he was doing it, but that it was taking up too much time. Like small, I was like, "Wow, this guy is." There's a wall here. There's nothing for me to, to, to get through. And there's a lot of risks. He had a family. He had, you know, there's legal risks. There's um, health risks. There's communal risks. There's a lot of different things when, you know, a religious guy is sleeping with prostitutes and, uh, yeah, you know, cheating on his wife. All of those things. And um, I saw that I wasn't able to get anywhere if I brought up twelve steps or any of the other. Things. So this was earlier in my days of psychedelics. I wasn't public at the time about it. Um, but I, for me, I, I used it for several years before I spoke. I'm not someone who right. like, does something and willy nilly talks. I, several years I was going through it, understanding it, seeing things that worked, seeing things that didn't before I began to, to, to speak about it. There's a lot of deliberation. Del- oh, and there are things I'm working on now. Wait till I. Oh. I, <laughs> I'm, joking. I'm joking. So. I said, so when I, so I, when I spoke to him, I said, listen, you're, you're kind of closed off to any, everything, so let me share with you something that I think could help, and it's probably the only thing that can help in your case. Um, and I, I mentioned, um, and I started talking about psychedelics, and he said, he, right away he went to, uh, but is it a Vajazara? Is it a, okay? And I said, what are you talking about? Like, you're doing the Gila Arias daily, Right. <laughs> I have to check with the rabbi. Okay, good, check. I'm not saying no, but let's have the conversation. Let's have the conversation about this so you hear it because I doubt before you're calling a prostitute, you're calling the rabbi. So let's, let's hold that thought for a second and let's go through because you have the opportunity to save yourself, save your family, and suddenly the first thought you're worried about is, should I, yeah. should I call the rabbi? It's, uh, yeah, it, it, when, when people are thinking like that, that is... I think that they're not real. Um, they don't internalize the religion. It's uh, right. It's like they need all these things in place, all these mechanisms, every step that they do, they need it in place instead of just living it. It's it's meant to fuel. It's meant to guide you, not you know. Right. Not uh, 
not shrink you, not destroy yeah. you, not. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. And I think like going back to that Balsemtiv point is that's, there was a like a, a revolution created where saying, hey, all those like things, like all those little tiny rules I was forcing everyone into a box, like let's give some flexibility to that. There isn't just the one person who can become the Tamil Chacham in the town that everyone respects, but maybe the simple Jew has something to say. Maybe he's not, you know, can't daven that well and can't, but he has a heart and there's something to, to learn. And now there's room for a lot of different people to shine. And somehow we moved from that. Okay. Yeah. Not, not a thousand percent, not a thousand percent, right? There's room for someone like you to get uh, known in community. There's room for someone like me to get known in community. But there is a sense that someone has to fight very hard to do what you did or I did. It's not, we're not, it, it's not this current that's moving people in this direction and it's like, hey, be you, be you, right? Like, let's, let's embrace. Or when I was talking to Mayor Kay and he's doubting whether the breath work is and they should be doing, I'm like, dude, you're saving people. You're saving people. You're helping people so, so much with what you're doing. You found the niche and here you are, you're able to deliver something so meaningful to people and you're wondering whether this is and that's the switch that I think is needed, is know that when we see someone like this, move them in, in that direction. I've shared it before, but certain themes I can talk about. Again, not everyone watches all of my stuff, but there was a sikh I learned about. Um, it says, Eish tamid tukad al right? That uh, by the um, base of Mikdash, was always a fire on the Mizbeach, and it says, it should always be there, it should not be burnt out. So the rabbi always said, there's the base of Mikdash, right? The physical one, and then there's our own internal one. And the Mizbeach represents our heart. It says, in our heart, there should be a fiery flame that's never put out. It should be always there. It says, there it's always on Shabbos, and always, and also, it says, Tamid afilu be Shabbos, afilu be, like, puzzle, but too much, something. Right? And what I took from there was that, like, someone should always be in a mode of passion. Like, find that thing that lights someone's heart of flame, and then say, okay, do that. Do that. Don't put people into a box. So if we're in a school, that to me, if I was running a school, I think that should be the mission statement. We want kids whose hearts are aflame. And in there it said, afilu b'shabas and afilu b'tuma, right? It said, even when someone is impure, meaning don't be afraid of passion. Passion is a good thing. Even if someone, if what you're seeing is an impure, the Mizbeach is an impure place, oh, we don't want this heart aflame because what it can do, get someone in their passion and mode, the soul's going to be expressed and good things will happen. Like, don't be afraid of a, yeah. Don't, don't be afraid of a fiery. A lot uh, of people are afraid of the fire. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of people are afraid of the passion versus saying, "Hey, we see that. Now start moving someone in that." Because uh, we gotta, we uh, we have to live in the sight. We have to live with the times, which means that we are in a place where we can discover this. We could, we can internalize what's going on and and uh and really live it you know and, and get rid of all the all the garbage that's that's that kept us alive right in a certain uh, state yeah right in a certain state but we're, we 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 could move on right it's very, it's very important to understand that a lot of these tools and it's the same when we're doing our own internal healing so oftentimes we have something like an addiction or something else that we dislike and even a porn addiction. I'll often tell people that if you want to he heal from it, write a thank you letter to your addiction. Why? Because it most likely, not most likely, it was for sure a survival strategy that you developed in order, in my case, I developed in order to get through a period of my life. So now I no longer want it anymore. I no longer want to watch porn on the daily. But maybe it's how, exactly how I survived um, mm. my teenage years. I didn't have the tools I have today. Okay, so now that I do, I can take these tools, but I don't have to pretend this is this terrible thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. You were there in important times. Now your friend who's overstayed is welcome. Goodbye. And I think that that's, as in the micro, so in the macro, um, that's individually we have survival strategies that we take on that become very toxic for us, and then we let them go. And the same is true um, in a community, that we take on certain things because for that period of time was necessary to get us through to the next state. But now that we're here, say thank you very much. Don't make it sacred. Don't make it holy. It very often isn't. And say, what is... And, and the evidence, meaning the proof is always in the pudding. The evidence is in the amount of people who are unhappy and rejecting um, a lot of what's being fed to them.
And I assure you that if what it was that was being delivered was godliness, they wouldn't be vomiting it. Exactly. Yeah, they're looking down and they're like, wait, wait, why am I holding all these bags? Where am I going? Right. You know? It's like when my wife gave me a box to put in the recycling and then an hour later, I'm sitting on the subway holding that box. I look down and I'm like, why am I still holding this box? I was supposed to put it in the backyard. Right. <laughs> you know, it's... uh we just there's a, there's a study that when I looked it up they're not sure if it's real or if it's made up but it makes a good point so they took five monkeys and they put it into a room in the middle of the room was a ladder with a banana on top and then they had the monkey obviously one mo- monkey's gonna go the most okay I'm gonna go up and grab the banana so they sprayed him with freezing cold water as he was climbing up the ladder and then each one that tried going up the ladder they and I said they sprayed all the monkeys. Sorry, they sprayed all the monkeys with freezing cold water. So everyone paid the price of the one monkey going up. Mm. Okay, and then they kept doing this until all the monkeys understood that anyone tries to go up the ladder to get the banana, you're all getting freezing cold water. Then they took one monkey out, introduced a new monkey. What happened to the new monkey when he came in? He climbed up the ladder. So they didn't have to spray the water. The other monkeys attacked mm. and said, no, don't go up the ladder. Right, because we've already paid the price. They started swapping them out one at a time. After they swapped them all out one at a time, there was no monkey was ever sprayed with cold water, but any new monkey being introduced who tried to get the banana was being attacked for going up. And I don't know if this is true. Like I said, right. I, when I looked up the study, I heard someone talk about it when I looked it up to create it. They're not sure if it's true or not true, this study, but the concept it's definitely true. It's definitely true. I've seen it in business many times where people are doing things. You say, why Why are we doing this? Oh, this, this is the way we do it around here. And then you backtrack, like, what was actually the origin of this? And you're like, guys, that was a different time, a different place. Like, <laughs> no, yeah. we're, not, we're not doing things anymore. We actually have computers. We don't have to put that in the mail. It's yeah. just a process from literally 20 years ago. This is what we do. This is what we do. <laughs> and then what happens, and this is the other part, what happens is that in a religious setting, we don't say, this is the way we do things, say, this is the way God wants us to do things. And then the kid who's experiencing this doesn't think this unpleasant thing is from some confused monkey whose ancestor got sprayed by, a banana, by, by cold water. They think it's God. Yeah. They're told it's God. Yeah. And then a lot of the... And then they have an association with religion. Exactly. It's like if, yeah, it's... it's it's like yelling at your kid, like, eat your dessert, <laughs> eat your ice cream, slapping that kid, you know, like, right, like what... why aren't you eating your ice cream? Right. You know, and then you'd be like, I don't know if I want ice cream anymore. I've, I've shared this story before, and we'll end with this, is um, when I was in the ninth grade in Lubavitch Cheshiva, I got into a fight with a kid in class, you know, he did a trick, he pulled my chair out from oh. under me, I fell backward, I attacked him, and whatever. I ended up getting kicked out of school for, for it. And I think they said, I have to learn like 12 Prakam of Tanya by heart before I come back. So when I came back for, I think, like the first one or something, so I was waiting outside the office, and it was a teacher, um, Yael Duran, who was in, in the English department there. Yeah, I had him too. And he asked me what I was doing, and I explained to him. And he went into the office. I guess he didn't know I can hear him because the walls were paper thin over there. And he was, I don't remember who it was who gave me the punishment. Which is good. I, I don't remember that, but I remember yelled around. And he was furious that they gave me a punishment to learn Tanya by heart. And he's like, "Are you crazy? You're going to ruin Tanya for this guy? Do you yeah. want to? Uh, do you want him to have a negative association with Tanya?" And he was so passionate <laughs> about this, so passionate uh-huh. and fiery, and they actually changed it that instead of learning the first twelve, I ended up uh, just having to learn the content of Paraklamat Bays, right? The, the right. portion of Tanya which deals with you know, loving a fellow Jew. So when I learned about that and then I studied it, what I remembered from it was how important it was to him that I had a positive association with Tanya. And I would say till today, it's, it's, inf- it's influenced me. There's, what I got from it was that to him, this safer is important. To him, this book is important. He wanted me to have a positive um, association with it. So it actually, wow. he, he got what he... Uh, what he wanted, but it's similar. What you're saying like eat your dessert, eat your dessert. Yeah, right. You're giving something that's yeah. you're saying is the most beautiful, but then you're so afraid. You know, it's me telling you Coke is the best in the world, but you can't try Pepsi. 
Yeah. If you're so sure, let them go. They should have given you Darwin ball pet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's it. That's what they should have done. Yeah. If you know how many people, when they call me with, um, in, you know, I won't say this because it's not communal. Yeah. You have to feel it out for one person to give that advice. So I'll, I'll leave this one um, as is. Let me ask you just one question. Sure. So when you spoke about your brother, clearly brought up much more emotion than when you spoke about your father, which was interesting. Why? Do you know why that is? I think it was just a certain certain kind of relationship that we had. And th- there's something about brothers and and siblings that um it's it's a very unique relationship, I think. At least with my brother. Right, right. Specifically with him, you and him were very close? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I think uh I mean, unless there's more. Right. No, I think I think we covered uh Yeah, it sounded yeah. like you were it looked like you were thinking about something and I interrupted. So whatever <laughs> no, you think about no, it. No, 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 no. No, I was just think I, I was I was uh trying to think why why that is. And um I can't really give a uh you know, a positive answer, you know, to know exactly uh why that is, but uh it is. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, that was interesting to me. In any case, I hope that this conversation was meaningful for you. It was for me. Yeah. Whether or not we put this out there or not, or you know, whatever we do with it, I've enjoyed it. And um, if this gets to see the uh, the light of day, then I hope 